Now, let me make this clear that this discussion is not pro one side or the other. It's not about that at all. We're simply going to discuss the effects of war and the war machine and apparatus on the living planet that we inhabit. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina, and I'm your host today as we discuss planet-killing wars. This is not a new concept. We all know that wars are bad. They are bad for many different reasons, and they result in the death of many, many people. There's the fallout of war, soldiers dying, villages rape and pillaging it's really been part of history of the human history and it's a tragic one at that but a big part of what hasn't been discussed when we discuss war is the tremendous impact that these wars have on the planet now we've come a long way from stones and spears that people used to use, that men used to use to fight each other and fight other various clans or populations. We've upped our game to many different types of bombs, bullets containing lead that are just left. They don't disappear. Matter is neither created nor destroyed. So whatever we leave on the planet stays on the planet. One of the things that often is not discussed is the environmental impact of these wars. We all know that in Vietnam, Agent Orange was developed to instantly make all of the leaves fall off of trees so that we could more efficiently kill the enemy. What type of impact does that have on the trees, on the ground, on the groundwater, people who drink the groundwater? This war in Ukraine is really amping up the game. We've heard about genocide. We've heard about crimes against humanity, aggression and war crimes, and what's been happening in the Black Sea is many, many dolphins have been washing up ashore dead. So Ukraine has come up with the idea to charge Russia with ecocide. That is the killing of the environment and the living beings who live in the environment. And they are using the death of a single porpoise to prove that these dolphins have been killed as a direct result of the poisoning of the ocean from the various war tactics used by Russia. Now, let me make this clear that this discussion is not pro one side or the other. It's not about that at all. We're simply going to discuss the effects of war and the war machine and apparatus on the living planet that we inhabit. I always find it so tragic, really, when you hear on the news. It's always tragic when there's natural disasters, right? It's, it's always tragic. But one of the things that is left out almost invariably is the impact that goes beyond economy, the impact that goes beyond houses flooded and businesses destroyed, and human lives lost. It's just much, much greater. We are not separate from this planet. Everything that affects the planet affects us, so we should care. We should be concerned. Uh, one of the things that I read about the many dolphins washing up from the Black Sea is that dolphins and porpoises, well, they're sort of like the canary in the coal mine, but I guess you could say they're the dolphin of the sea. That is, they tell us about the health of the oceans. And when they are no longer able to sustain life in the oceans in which they live, it doesn't just tell us about, well, some dolphins died. It tells us about the state of the entire marine environment. So it's truly, truly frightening. It's truly concerning. We all know that this planet is the ocean planet. And when, the, when our ocean planet is destroyed and poisoned, there's no way that it's not going to have an effect. 
So I'm going to pass it on to Peter and I want to hear your thoughts on maybe the impact of war in general or specific to the one we're discussing now. Thank you, Regina. I think I, I'll start with an expert General Stonewall Jackson and his famous quote, which we should all remember in my view, made in 1860, before that horrible civil war in the United States, in which he stated, it is painful enough to discover with what unconcern people speak of war and threaten it. They do not know its horrors. I have seen enough of it to make me look upon it as the sum of all evil. So in my view, that is absolutely right. I think we're seeing more than enough confirmation of this in this horrible war going on in the middle of Europe. The uh, recent uh, Sustainable Development Goal UN Summit had a section in which they gave some statistics on war, which were absolutely terrible. I'll just uh, mention that we are now at the highest level of state-based armed conflict since 1945. In other words, since the end of the Second World War, this year, last year, there's more conflicts than ever. More than 238,000 people, according to the UN, died in global conflict last year. As regards to the environment, we're seeing these terrible, terrible, excruciating images of um, not only cities being damaged and uh, whole apartment buildings, you know, but the villages, right? I don't know whether people have noticed when these villages are liberated, there's nothing left of the village. <clears throat> They're not villages anymore. Nobody lives there. Of course, Ukraine is well known for a wonderful um, farmland, one of the world's top regions of farmland. That land is now being pockmarked with shells and trenches. The forests are being destroyed. Forests always get destroyed in war. And uh, we know that this is no exception in Ukraine. Now, I was quite shocked when a month or so ago, I, I checked the fire map, NASA's fire maps for fires periodically, and I noticed in the middle of Europe, there was a, an area of very, very intense fires like nowhere else in Europe. So I found out, oh, it's Ukraine. So Ukraine is uh, having by far the most fires in all of Europe. Um, they're constant. They never go out. I looked at them closely, and of course, um, not surprising that most of the very high concentration of fires, and I want to point out that there are fires right across Ukraine, but where the war is being uh, waged, of course, most of the fires. Also, I want to point out, and I only noticed this today, that those fires actually go over the border substantially into Russia. So uh, clearly, they're both, we are having uh, the atrocity. War is an atrocity, in my view, and there are no winners. There's no victor, victors in war, in my view, only victims. And uh, we've seen a, enough of, of the pain and the agony. Uh, I don't have to uh, dwell on that. But if people really value their land, you know, their forests, their fields, their agriculture, seems to me they would work a lot harder to avoid conflict of this kind. And I'm talking all nations, all nations. Europe has a horrible history as regards war for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. There's always been wars going on in Europe somewhere. So the uh, wildlife, of course, right? The forests are being absolutely trashed. Um, birds, wildlife, they will be not only being killed, I mean, this shelling is absolutely out of sight crazy, right? I mean, huge craters. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, Maxar satellite maps on uh, Ukrainian, East Ukrainian fields, they're just pockmarked with these massive holes that these shells make. So that's been completely ruined. So I think that's really um, all I want to say except that it's very painful personally to me of how this war in Ukraine is going on longer and longer and longer. And it's normalizing war. If you watch one of these uh, programs that are on every day, every night, on the so-called progress of the war in Ukraine, it's being normalized. There's no, there's no hint 
that this is a terrible thing. There's no hint of Stonewall Jackson's, this is a sum of all evil that we're witnessing. No hint of that whatsoever. And I really, really strongly dislike that. I think it's terrible. Oh, but I will say one final thing on this war. The hopes of um, a settlement to stop the destruction of the entire planet with greenhouse gas pollution, there's no chance whatsoever of any settlement so long as we have the hostilities going on that we have in the world. And I'm talking Russian Federation, United States, NATO, China. And I'll just finish by closing by saying that it does appear that the UN numbers indicate that with regards to conflict and war and instability and the threat to the entire planet, the situation has never been worse. I can remember the Cold War very, very well. This is way worse. We're in far more danger from nuclear weapons and nuclear war today. As many people have said, the United States has about 60, uh, has about 6,000 nuclear weapons. It used to have 60,000. And and Russian Federation has got about the same. So we're looking at more than enough nuclear weapons still to destroy our lovely planet many times over. What could be more insane or evil for that matter? Thank you, Peter. It does seem as though our species is invested in developing more and more uh, military artillery that has uh, greater planet-killing potential. I just want to offer this quote from Mr. Maxim Popov. He's an advisor to the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, especially as it's focused on environmental issues. And here it is. The environment is often called the silent victim of war. It's so true. It's a silent victim of war. No one seems to care. And he adds that the environment has no citizenship and no borders. That means when dolphins wash ashore in the Black Sea, we see dolphins washing ashore on the coast of New Jersey, which we have recently seen. It's terrible what we're doing. Paul, what are your thoughts on this whole issue? Yes. Well, the military industrial complex is often being said to be one of the organizing fundamental principles of society. You know, the fact that humans are basically, you know, we're a warring society. It, it's been throughout history where from people first stepping out of caves with clubs to go and <laughs> battle other people coming out of other caves with clubs. And, you know, we think that we're civilized and uh, have morals that we stand by. But when our back is against the wall and we're lacking food or water or resources, you know, we fight to to get out of that situation. You know, we have a world of uh, artificial uh, borders set up between countries, and countries will basically fight to the death to protect every square inch of their borders, and these borders are just human constructs. So war is part of human nature. You can't separate it. We fight on the land, we fight in the oceans, in the seas, the air, and also in space. And we have these weapons of mass destruction that can destroy the planet many times over. If you haven't seen the movie Oppenheimer, go and see it. Those bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki at, to end World War II um, are about 20 kilotons of TNT equivalent. And we carry weapons on missiles and on aircraft and on submarines uh, that are a thousand times more powerful. We're talking many megatons of energy. So imagine weapons a thousand times more powerful than that which destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We have thousands of those weapons that could be fired any time at the push of a button. So as Peter was saying, you know, we're in a very, very risky situation. But and he's also, Peter brought up, I love the quote from Stonewall Jackson and the statistics on war. So Peter mentioned 238,000 people died last year due to war. So let's talk about the war that we're being exposed to from our planet right now. I'm talking about abrupt climate change. You know, how many people can that kill on our planet? Well, let's look at, uh, you know, the biggest, the biggest predator on the planet is actually the mosquito. It kills about 700,000 people per year, believe it or not. You know, people are scared of sharks. They should be, you know, scared of mosquitoes or even hippos that kill more people than, than sharks every year. 
air pollution from fossil fuel burning kills almost 10 million people per year. I mean, that dwarfs any deaths due to war. Rep climate change is going to take out our food system and our water system. And people have put some numbers and for every thousand tons of CO2 that we emit today, that kills one future person. And we're talking about billions of people perishing in the foreseeable future because of the stresses from abrupt climate system change, taking out our ability to grow food, our ability to supply water. So these sort of things, you know, as bad as individual wars are, and of course, individual wars dominate the news, right? They, they completely dominate the, the news. This week, for example, Canada is all a buzz about a 98-year-old man who went to war when he was 14, okay? So basically, he was born in 1925, World War II started. He went to war, and his age was varied between 14 and 18, 19 during World War II. And he, he was accused of fighting for the Nazis. Poland wants him extradited. Things like this dominate the news, and yet we're facing much, much worse with climate change and politicians don't know what to do about it or are, try not to do anything about it. We, li we live in a very, very crazy, crazy world. But the threats from abrupt climate change, they dwarf anything else on this planet, apart from the megaton nuclear weapons that we have that could be triggered at the push of a button. This is the world that we live in. So not only is there war against other people, other nations, but there's an even bigger war that is ongoing against the planet, against our home, basically. And it only has so much resilience before it folds. Yeah, uh, it only has so much resilience. And as you said, the degree of artillery we have, the deadliness of it, it just seems to continue to increase. And then Peter was speaking to the normalization of this. I mean, the fact that it is all just so normalized blows me away. And the idea that it's like a government, like the United States government, can look to an island in Micronesia and say, you know, we're going to move these people out and we're going to bomb the hell out of it. And that's what they did in the Bikini Atoll. They just bombed it and bombed it and tested all of these nuclear weapons. And the fallout was so much more extreme than they ever expected. And who knows? You know, it affected other nearby atolls and islands. Of course, you know, when you, when you continually bomb and test weapons on a, a small island in the middle of the ocean, the fallout is going to land in the ocean. Do we really think that that is healthy? It just makes no sense. And the idea, the audacity of man to say, I'm going to build, not only am I going to build these bombs that are incredibly destructive, but I'm going to find some islands in the middle of nowhere and use these bombs to blow it the hell up time after time. The testing in the Bikini Atoll lasted, I don't know how many years, but it wasn't just one time. It was years of bombing. Now, in terms of normalization, make no mistake that the bikini was invented after that bombing. You know, the history of the bikini was, you know, we've heard the term, oh, she's a real bombshell. Well, the bikini that we now know and wear was so named after the bikini atoll that United States blew the hell out of. So talk about normalization and the, in a way, glamorization of murderous war. It's frightening. Um, and I know that you said, Peter, that it, it's an evil and it's atrocity. What about this normalization and how does it affect the minds of humanity that we accept this? What does it say about the mind of humanity? Well, because I was very heavily involved in the um, International Physicians Against Nuclear War, Physicians for Social Responsibility, back in the days when there was a real fear that we would blow up the planet and ourselves to smithereens. And in retrospect, we know that we narrowly escaped that at least three documented times. I looked into this a, a lot, a lot. Why why must we continue to have all these weapons? At the time, it was focused, obviously, on nuclear weapons. So I looked into the anthropology and, and the culture, 
When it comes to uh, resolving uh, international disputes and conflicts, um, uh, our civilization today is remarkably stupid. I think it was Margaret Mead that made the statement, war is the worst dispute settlement mechanism ever invented. I don't believe that, we're, that in actual fact, we inherit a propensity to war. There's a lot of cultures historically who, yes, had weapons, had conflicts, faced each other off, but they had mechanisms in place in which they didn't actually end up by killing hordes of people. So th that's very, very well documented. And we call, we, we call that primitive warfare, but I think our warfare is the most primitive that has ever, ever been. And I came to the conclusion that there's only one explanation. Um, for war and and the acquisition and the build-up uh, of these armaments, which, Regina, you, you focused on very well, and I thank you for that, because that's really what all this is about. It's um, how much damage we can do to each other and the planet, because they do, um, they do happen at the same time, because war is just so damn destructive, right? Kills a lot of people and destroys a lot of the environment, forests and wildlife, everything goes. So what we have to do is what we actually were quite successful in doing by bringing down the um, nuclear weapons by a tenth or more, we've still got a lot to get rid of, but that was sort of a deal that was made with Ronald Reagan of all people and the then um, USSR chief, Gorbachev. And that agreement has been maintained right through the decades. We actually have been destroying nuclear warheads. And uh, that's a very interesting contract between uh, the Russian Federation and the United States. So it's not that we, we can't do it. And I believe that, um, and one of the reasons why I so strongly object to the normalizing of war, I believe that war as we're seeing it today, is a cultural insanity, basically. And um, I also, um, I think you both mentioned the business aspect of war. So war today, right, is the most evil bloody business ever, ever. So I looked, and I won't give, give you the numbers because they're horrible enough. There are uh, military contract armaments companies throughout Europe. It's not just in the United States. They are throughout Europe. They are making tens of billions of dollars, like on, on a month or two monthly basis. There's a German armaments contractor who has backup, what you, you call, I say, backlogged orders for armaments for this particular war of $45 billion. That's just one contractor in Europe. So I, I really think that the uh, approach to, to make is to present the moral aspect as well as the destructive, insane aspect so that we can convert from a culture of war. We are a culture of war. Our economy is a war-based economy. That economy has only gotten worse since World War II. And thank you, Paul, for bringing up the military industrial complex, because that is, as you said, the big basis, right, of th these wars being constant, right, all over the world, and then uh, huge wars breaking out li like the Ukraine. So I want to say and put an appeal out there that war is obviously, war is obviously the greatest evil ever. And it just gets more and more evil. We're witnessing that, for heaven's sake. All idea of ethics, morality, decency, cooperation, it all disappears in the face of war. So, you know, authors have explained this, you know, how can we immediately switch when a war is declared, right, from a civilization and a people who value, right, who value ethics, and um, behaving well between each other, uh, resolving conflicts, not getting into arguments. One day and the next day, we're into a completely opposite, opposites of all of these, right? 
we become horrendous killers, you know, with no thoughts of pity or decency whatsoever. And this is where there are no sides in war, because this is war. It's not one side or the other side or the other side. It is war. So I guess I'll finish with, with an appeal, if you like, for, um, for us to um, smarten up, if nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I definitely hope humanity can uh, smarten up. Now, I'm not going to say I have faith in that, but I, I do hope. And I will say that this video has helped me to smarten up. And those of you who are out there watching, I hope that you've learned something about the military industrial complex and its effects on the planet. If you have, be sure to like this video. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Paul. Yes, thank you. I have a set of cascading feedbacks here. I have a cat who jumps up on my lap and then the dog immediately jumps up from a deep sleep to come over and wants to jump on my lap and he's about 65 pounds. But anyway, I'll try to uh, kind of continue without them distracting me too much. Of course, Shackleton and and, uh, and Newton I'm talking about. Oh, there he is. <laughs> so the U.S., the military budgets are, are incredibly high. They're high, higher than they've ever been in history. You know, the U.S. budget alone for the military um, approaches a trillion dollars a year. But fossil fuel subsidies are seven trillion dollars per year at least seven times higher you know you may have heard of uh talk of trying to green the military because fossil fuel emissions alone from militaries around the world would if it if they were you know if it was a country all the militaries of the world it would be in the top five of emissions so you know i don't see uh solar powered tanks or wind-powered ships for the military in the future. It's absolutely absurd. I mean, fossil fuels are of fundamental importance to militaries around the world to power them, to allow them to, to wage war. So, you know, we, we have a, a huge difficulty or conundrum in dealing with this. Basically, it's not going to happen. So if you want to have hope, we need to hope that we can develop technologies to pull carbon out of the atmosphere faster than we put it in, to maybe shield some of the sunlight, to try to stabilize planetary temperatures so that we can still maintain some semblance of order and be able to grow food on the, in the, pla on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Because right now we're heading to a place where the survival of, of humanity, the survival of civilization, organized society is at threat. And people don't really understand the power of, of nuclear weapons, the power of the arsenals that we have, because, you know, fusion bombs that are at the megaton levels of TNT equivalent have not killed people. They've not been dropped on cities. I mean, we think of cities, you know, we, we know of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and those 20 kiloton bombs, but we have 20 megaton bombs a thousand times more. So it doesn't take many of those to be detonated um, that would then cause a so-called nuclear winter and block sunlight and cause us to not be able to grow food for several years. Those sort of things are there, you know, so we need to, you know, as Peter says, we need to smarten up as a society if we want to survive. I mean, there's something called the Fermi paradox and the, the, the Fermi paradox uh, deals with the question of why we haven't detected signs of intelligent life other places in the universe. One of the main ideas is that any civilization developing on a planet such as ours eventually um, destroys itself. And so therefore, if, the, if such a uh, situation happened elsewhere in the universe, then there's, there, there's no signal that we're going to hear from, from, from people. So, you know, this could explain partly why we haven't detected any signs of life elsewhere in the universe, because the progression is that societies develop technologically, use up their resources, and then basically implode. So anyway, we're a uh, sentient species. We're supposed to be intelligent and, you know, we have a choice 
we're kind of our backs are against the wall. We, we, we have a choice to make, but the earth isn't waiting while we make this choice. The earth is experiencing abrupt climate system change, which puts more and more stress on societies and makes societies less and less willing to negotiate and talk about things to try to resolve problems. I mean, we, we think we have the luxury of time, but, but we don't, I think. We're kind of, uh, you know, in this, this, this very precarious situation as a society, as a planet. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, we definitely don't have the luxury of time. And we need to, as Peter said, smarten up. It's, it's been a really rough topic. I thank all of you for being able to stay to the end. This would be a really good time to start a dialogue on what you think in terms of the various wars. Peter mentioned there's so many going on. It's not just the war in Ukraine and their impact on our environment and on the psychological effects on our species and also the moral effects and implications. I don't think it's chicken or the egg. Uh, I think the lack of morality leads to war and then war leads to a lessening of morality. But what do you think? We would like to hear your thoughts in the comments. And if you haven't, please like, share and subscribe. And we look forward to seeing you next time here on the Climate Emergency Forum. <music>